Well, hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. I'm your host, Mike, Mike Marsh, the product manager of Dragonfly at ORS. You can follow me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter. Be sure and check out our YouTube page, orss.ca slash YTP2. That is the playlist for the Dragonfly Daily. You, while you're there, you can browse the channel and find other content on Dragonfly and image processing. So thank you for joining us today. Today is lesson 27 in the Dragonfly Daily. We will be talking about four-dimensional work in Dragonfly. We'll talk mostly about four-dimensional images but we will talk around and about the idea of four-dimensional meshes or four-dimensional graphs or four-dimensional ROIs or shapes, but just tangentially. So if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. If you're watching this on YouTube and you want to be watching this live so you can ask questions and interact with a presenter, then check out the description where you can find the spot where you can uh, register to watch live and get the invite so you can watch this, which happens every day. Now, this is lesson 2740 in Dragonfly. We will be working with Dragonfly 4.1, a slightly customized version of the out of the box Dragonfly experience, which you can learn about in the lesson six customizing Dragonfly. So, Working in 4D in Dragonfly, we will see that images can be imported as four-dimensional images. When importing an image, you can specify your 4D matrix dimensions. So for example, you might have a 400 TIFFs that you tell Dragonfly to import. You could tell it to import 400 TIFFs if let's say they were all 100 by 100 pixels. You could tell Dragonfly to import that as a single 3D matrix, 100 by 100 by 400, since it's 400 slices or you could instruct it that it should be interpreted as 100 by 100 by 100 in 3D times four in the fourth dimension. So you would have four time steps. So the first 100 slices would form your 3D matrix for time step one, the next 100 slices, the, the 3D matrix for time step two, et cetera, et cetera. You will also see that 4D images in Dragonfly can be cropped. We've already seen how 3D images can be cropped in X, Y, and Z. When you have a 4D image, it can also be cropped in T. That is, you can crop it into time slices if we want to use that nomenclature for time. You'll also see that multiple 3D images can be composited to form a four-dimensional image. So apart from importing data as 4D, you can take multiple 3D image data sets and then align them, register them, and then compose Posit them as 4D. Now, we will be deliberately making a point of how time is different from space. So we do not have full equivalence in time and space dimensions in Dragonfly. I will explain how four-dimensional images have no defined origin, or we could say they all have the same origin. We'll get to that in a few minutes. And we'll also see how all time slices have the same thickness. You should be aware now that Dragonfly supports data set of different pixel sizes. The pixels can have different, you can have three micron pixels and two micron pixels, and they can have different origins as we just mentioned. Well, the time in Dragonfly is really just an index. It can be time equals one, two, or three. It can't be time equals 5.7 milliseconds or time equals 100 microseconds. So there is no time thickness in Dragonfly. It's just a limitation of the current model of time. So we'll get all to all of that in a few minutes. Let's pop over to Dragonfly. I have two data sets we're gonna work with today. Um, I wanna thank, I, I think it was Lars and collaborators. Oh man, let's turn off this and turn off notifications. Thank you, Benjamin, but I'll hear what you have to say later. Now, we, I do wanna thank uh, Lars and collaborators who shared some four-dimensional data, but I'm actually gonna use for today, I'm going to use data from the Digital Rocks portal for this 4D demonstration because they're easy to access and download and they can help uh, make the demonstration case. The data I am using today, we will be looking at two different data sets from the Digital Rocks portal. The first one is called 4D Imaging of Acid Leaching in a Porous Carbonato Diamond. This come from These data come from Scott Eckley and Richard Ketchum at uh, UT in Austin. And this is a five time step or an initial time step and or an initial scan followed by four incremental steps, I guess, of acid leaching. Haven't looked too closely at this data. I just wanna show you the 4D capacity of Dragonfly. And the second one I'll look at is uh, these data from Amaya Rucker at Imperial College in collaboration with workers from Shell and Math to Market and University of Mainz, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of it and uh, uh, Levin, Levin's. So and a lot of collaborative workers on this data set. We'll look at this one which has 30 time steps and we'll look at this one which has five time steps. I'm not sure I'll import all of them but I'll show you how it works in Dragonfly. You can find these very easily on the Digital Rocks portal. I'm going to pop over to Dragonfly now and 
Um, here in Dragonfly, I can use File, Import Image Files, and I can browse to a four-dimensional data set. So in this case, I have this data set, the 40 Acid Leaching Carbonato Diamond. It comes as a zip file. If you unzip it, you can navigate into the folders, and you will find, if you dig deep enough, Project 219, and then you keep digging, and then we find the original data, and they are categorized into sub-projects. If I go to Project 836 Images, what we have here is a list of files. If I have all files turned on, you see there are some TIFF files and some thumbnails. I'm going to hit the filter for just TIFF, and then I'm going to, I can select one, but I'm going to hit Control A. And what I have done now is I have uh, put in my queue 448 TIFF slices. Now I can click Add again, and I can navigate up a few folders, and let's go here, Project 219, Origin, and from, we just did 836. Now let's do 837, Images, and I will uh, do Control A. I still have TIFF, so it's not pulling in those thumbnails. And now I have the first 448 slices, and then I have data set two, the next uh, 448 slices. I'll click Next again. Whoops, not Next. I will click Add again, and we will go, that was 836 and 837. Let's do one more. That should prove the point. Control A and open. And now I click next. At this point, I have 448 slices times three or 1,344 slices. And it is telling me I can subsample in uh, X and Y and Z and T, but I can also specify how many slices in T. So if I tell it three and hit tab, now it's going to say, oh, you don't want me to interpret that as 448 times three slices as a three-dimensional data set. You want it to be 1,012 by 1,024 by 448 times three in Z. Now I don't remember the pixel size, so I'll just come over here and look at it in my browser for the Digital Rocks page. If I click here, it tells me that the pixel size is 14.36 microns in X, Y, and Z. So let's do that 14.36, 14.36, and 14.36. Let's correct the typo here. And that is enough to import this uh, Carbonado Diamond uh, Acid Leaching. 4D data set with uh, three different time steps. So I'll hit finish. It will import the data into Dragonfly. And now we have the data loaded and we can see it. So we can see it in 3D. We can, uh, we can see over here that it says it's 1,012 by uh, 1,024 by 448 by three time steps. Now, if you look on the uh, text presenters, you'll see there is a time step one of three. If I just drag this up, I advance to the other time steps. You'll also note that, of course, I have uh, brightness and contrast. If I adjust the brightness and contrast in my 2D, you'll see that it will apply the same window leveling across time steps. So if I scroll down to time step one or two or three, uh, everything is fine. Uh, now I can take this data. Let's turn up the brightness and contrast. Uh, I could also apply a shape. If I put a shape in here and I say I want this shape to, uh, to actually, yeah, I won't use a shape. I'll just use the regular uh, clip box for the data. So I'll select it, turn on the clip box, and clip like this, and then turn off the clip box. And now I can still uh, slice through the data and I can see the different uh, the different time points. You can make a movie in here. So if I double clicked and I were to right click and ask for the movie maker, then I'm on time step one and maybe I change the camera, maybe I zoom in and I can go to another time step, like time step three and add a snapshot. And what it will do when I play back this movie is it'll adjust the camera and then a third of the way through, it'll advance from time step uh, one to two and then another third, uh, time step two to three. We have a nice, nice video on YouTube of a data set that has, I don't know, 80 or 400 time steps. It's it's a light sheet data, light sheet microscopy data collected by Ryan McCone at at Harvard. Sorry, I was about to say MIT, but it's a Ryan McCone at Harvard. And it's a nice movie where you're seeing the camera move and you're seeing the data update. And it's done just like this. You create one time step, another key, one keyframe, another keyframe, and then you animate. So. That is how easy it is to work with 4D data and work with uh, animations and movies. Now I'm going to close the Movie Maker. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you 
how you could work with data that you didn't import, but maybe you had multiple 3D data sets and you need to register them before you created a 4D data set. So I'm gonna reset my clip box and I'm gonna double click so we can see all these views. Now, one thing I can do is I can right click on my data and I go to modify and transform crop. And now in crop, instead of just X, Y, and Z, or X, Y, and Z dimensions, I also have a time dimension. So if I were to crop the time from one to one and create a new data set, then I have, this is a 3D data set, right? It's just the 3D data set for time equals one. So I'm just gonna name this T equals one. And that's a little hard to read. Let's just put T equals one as the file name. Then I could do the same operation again. I could uh, get the time equals two and I could create a new data set. And this is the T equals two data set. Now I'm gonna turn off the clip box on my 4D data set. So I've got these two 3D data sets. You could imagine they've done some sort of four dimensional experiment. You've created a scan, you've adjusted a parameter, done another scan, and now you have two different data sets. Maybe they're not perfectly registered. You can import in one, and that would be T equals one. You can import the other, that would be T equals two. And now the question is, how would you composite them in Dragonfly? So I'm gonna turn on the visibility of this data set and we will um, turn on Oh, let's go to a 2D view and maybe make it a slightly different color and use alpha. And so we can see both data sets right now. And if I select this one and I turn on move, I could reposition it. I could uh, change its brightness and contrast, change its position, rotate. Well, uh, I don't know why I can't rotate it right now, but uh, hmm, interesting. I'll have to look into that later. But we can change its position and orient it. I can also uh, undo these moves. Oh, I wonder if, let's have a quick look at, it may, Dragonfly may be confused because I was working earlier in time step three. I'm gonna go back to time step one. That could be a useful lesson for us. And let's see if I can uh, move this back. Very good, I'm gonna undo the moves. So you could position your multiple 3D image data sets. Then if you wish to create a new 4D data set, you can simply right click on a data set and go to create 4D data set. Then I could say I want time step one and I want time step two. And I, you can ask it to show the box. And now you can take this box and say, I wanna create a new 4D data set. You can set the bounds of the box so we can include all the data. Or if you don't have memory, maybe just wanna do a smaller version of the data. So you can set this box wherever you want it. And then when you click uh, export, it'll create a new data set that is four dimensional and it will include all of these in this particular order. So it'll be T equals one, then T equals two. Uh, you can always reorder this if you've imported them in the wrong order. That will take your multiple 3D data sets and then you might call this 4D stitching. If you think about it long enough, you'll see this is just a, another extrapolation of 2D stitching and 3D stitching. But uh, in Dragonfly, it's just called create 4D data set. And then you hit export and you have a new data set. Um, there could be interpolation if you rotate the box, so uh, beware of that. So I think that's all we need to look at there. So that is just a, a brief idea of uh, uh, opening multiple data sets and then aligning them and registering them. Okay, and you'll note that only if I have a 4D data set selected do I actually see this time step slider. So I'm gonna remove this data and I'm gonna go back over to my slides um, to visit another point. So. I started telling you that time is not the same as space in Dragonfly, and here's a little bit of what I mean. If I, I can always load two 2D or 3D images, and they can have different pixel sizes, and I could position the origin of one so that it lines up with the origin of another, or I could uh, translate it so that maybe the pixels here are supposed to overlap with these pixels. So data have pixel size and they have origin, and so you can register them and get them exactly where you need them. Now, we also have the idea of time, as I've mentioned it, and you can have a data set with one time point, so a three-dimensional data, or you can have a four-dimensional data set in Dragonfly. But this time doesn't really have any meaning. You can't say, well, this time is supposed to correspond with uh, this. That is, you cannot change the origin in time. So, no, nope, this is not allowed. All images have the same origin in T. That's just a limitation of the current time model in Dragonfly. Now, the next thing I want to say, suppose you have two different data sets and you're trying to do, if you can imagine, four-dimensional correlative microscopy, and you may want to say, well, what if I have 
the second time data set and it has wider slices. So each data set is 500 milliseconds, whereas my first data set is 240 milliseconds per slice. I'm sorry, that's not allowed in Dragonfly either. They all have to have the same thickness in T, same origin and same thickness. Um, now, uh, the question I want to pose now is, okay, well, that's images. What about shapes, meshes, ROIs, and graphs? Do they work four-dimensionally? Well, the answer is uh, yes, but no. So they don't exactly work uh, four-dimensionally. Um, you fundamentally... The, all the data structures are fully four-dimensional. We've built in the data structures so that they can support it, but the user interface and functionality haven't really caught up. And so I'll show an example that um, might highlight this point. So I've created an organizer with this uh, Ketten, oh, it says Ketten Sandstone. That's a typo, it's Ketten Limestone. So in this case, there is a 3D data set uh, that's sort of high resolution and high contrast. And this would be a good data set, for example, for segmenting the grain. So I could uh, do an upper Otsu and add to new. And now I have a segmentation of all of the grains in my Ketten Limestone. This is a three-dimensional data set. And this is a three-dimensional ROI. Now, I also have the four-dimensional data set, the Ketten Sandstone Water Flood. There's a typo on Water Flood. Um, so in this case, you'll see that there is a temporal experiment where the sample was, I don't know, maybe it was saturated with oil and then um, and then they flooded water through the sample or maybe the inverse. Sorry, I'm not really a hydrologist or a petroleum engineer, so I don't um, know the details and I'm not really uh, up to speed where I could understand the details of the experiment, but it's a 4D data set. So now if I hide these and I look at this one for a moment, and I select this one, then we'll see that this is time step one. And if I scroll through the time steps, we can see that the pore space is changing. So there is something, um, there is a fluid displacement that's happening that gives some interesting uh, wettability uh, results to help understand the Ketten limestone rock. So uh, we've imported this 4D data set. Now, um, segmentation is not really supported in 4D. So I mentioned a moment ago that the ROI is fundamentally a 4D data structure, but the user interface and the software haven't caught up. So I'll, I'll explain that. You can uh, take this data set and create a new ROI. And if my, let's say we call this ROI the uh, the attenuating fluid. So there's a dark fluid in the pore space. I don't know if that's oil or water and there's a bright fluid. So we'll just call this the bright fluid. If I give it this geometry, which is a four dimensional image, then the ROI itself will be a four dimensional ROI. So if I click here, you can see that it's a four dimensional ROI. Now what I could do is I could take this image and I could uh, try thresholding. So if I come over here and I do define range, I could try and uh, threshold those, uh, those bright fluid. Now, I can select this ROI and I can add to this ROI. Hang on a second, let's see what time step I am at. I'm at time step one. So if I select ROI and I click add, it's gonna add this interval, you know, that is all of these bright pixels, but it's only gonna add it for this time step. So now I have bright fluid defined, Maybe I should have been a little more careful. Actually, let's undo and let's lower this and then click add. So now I've added all this and that's my bright fluid for time step one. If I advance to time step two, uh, it has not added anything. So I would have to, uh, I would have to add again. So you can have a four dimensional ROI. Let's add one more time step and you'll see part of the inconvenience here is uh, the ROI doesn't give you a time slider here. Um, I will mention that if you have scene view properties open, there is a time slider, a global time slider for your whole scene. So I can go to uh, time step three and I can once again use the uh, define range and add. And now if I turn this off, we can see that I've defined the bright fluid phase for time steps one, two, and three. So it does have the functionality in some places and the data structure is intrinsically 4D, but there's not a button that says add to all time slices and it's not really supported. Um, so we could add a lot of functionality and make this work if we have uh, users who are requesting it or sort of driving uh, that use case of doing 4D 
imaging and 4D meshes and 4D ROIs, all of that could be extended. We would just need to sort of set a priority list of what functions people want to see. So you could build a four dimensional ROI of your bright fluid and your dark fluid, and then maybe you could do some statistical comparisons and evaluations, et cetera. Um, I could create a, a cylinder shape like we've seen before. The cylinder shape is not truly four dimensional or it is four dimensional, but I can't interact with the four dimensions in Dragonfly. So if I create a cylinder, whatever radius it has in time step one, it's going to have the same radius in all time steps. Now, clearly that's what you would want in this data set, but you might have other experiments where you need a shape to change. So all those could be extended in the future, but for now, basically Dragonfly, when you're working with four dimensional data, it's very well supported for images not so well supported for correlative imaging where you've got multiple signals especially if you've got different time pixel slice thicknesses or different time origins not really supported and then the other functionality such as graphs and meshes are not not well supported so that is something we could add we could set it so that if you take this uh this four dimensional ROI and you create a mesh, maybe you want to scroll through and see how the mesh changes. And so the mesh could have different state at every time point. All that could be added, doesn't exist right now. But that gives you an idea of what you can do in Dragonfly with the four dimensional uh, capabilities, at least for images for now. With that, I'm gonna go to the questions and answers. There are a bunch of people in the room, but no one has typed in any questions. So um, you guys are still in the room. I assume that means you can hear me. Uh, we've never gotten to the end of a presentation and not had any questions. So if ah, you guys can hear me, all right. Um, no one can think of any questions. So this is maybe is a bit of an edge case. I know there are not too many people that work with 4D data. It's a, it's a, a small percentage of users. So we do have a question now. How do you handle registration in 4D? The carbon other diamond time steps seem to be perfectly aligned. No mean task with an irregular shape. So the question here is, uh, how do you do the registration? And it works exactly the same as you would do for any correlative experiment where you've got two different 3D uh, images. You'd import one, you'd import the other, and you would do 3D registration. You could do it with the manual registration and then with the automatic sub voxel registration. All that's covered in lesson nine. I think it's lesson, nope, it's not lesson nine. Uh, maybe lesson 14, 3D fusion and uh, 3D stitching, that covers the 3D registration task. So you could align the two data sets, register the two data sets, and then you could uh, create, uh, right click and do create 4D data set, then define the box and uh, stitch or uh, composite them in the right temporal order. So um, those data, yeah, so those data were of course aligned before posting to the Digital Rocks portal, but you could use the methods we've described here to align them in Dragonfly. All right, um, next question. It's quite common in cell culture treatments. Definitely look forward to expanded 3D analysis. Well, yeah, that'd be good. I mean, we could consider, um, you know, how are you gonna track the nuclei in 4D data or how are you going to track the cell front or just track cell positions? So all that uh, has some interesting areas for exploration and expansion. Next question, can you go over two data sets with different pixel size again, please? Can you do registration for different pixel size? Uh, if yes, how? So no, I don't have time to go over that right now. That's all covered in that data, in that experiment or in that lesson about 3D stitching. So um, I'm gonna pull that up for us if we go to YouTube and we look for the Dragonfly Daily on 3D stitching. You will see how to register the data sets. You can always import data sets. You can always, so it's lesson 13. So you can always import data sets. You can always set the pixel size and then you can just use the simple registration tools. They work irregardless. <laughs> I just said irregardless, uh, that's not a word. Uh, someone's gonna hurt me for that later. Sorry, they will all work regardless of pixel size. So you can do the stitching and do the fusion and then set the output uh, if you need to, need to. But you can do the alignment and registration and then if you wanna stitch them with the same pixel size into a 4D data set, that's fine. So that's the video you want. I wonder if we go to the uh, object research page, I wonder if we could find the video for uh, Ryan McCone's um, uh, 3D data set. Oh, wow. He's got some pretty cool videos. I haven't seen those. We had one um, that we did in Dragonfly that shows the full animation, um, uh, which, yeah, we'll find it later. Um, but, uh, but Dragonfly does, of course, have the capability of making those movies as we saw earlier. And 
yeah, I wish I could find it here. Uh, it's a nice little movie, and uh, it shows you the, the richness of, of 4D animation. All right, let's go back to the questions. Can you hack the 4D segmentation issue by importing a 4D data set as a 3D data set for one time step segment, and then split the data set and ROI into time steps after segmentation? Or does that have to be defined as 4D on importing? No, you could do exactly what you said. You could import all of the different data sets, process them all, and then stitch them all together. Can you stitch a f uh, ROIs? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, let's find out. So if I take this and I crop it, so this is a 4D data, 4D ROI. If I crop it to ROI time one, so that's uh, ROI t equals one, and then I repeat with ROI t equals two, and this is ROI t equals two, can I do 4D stitching? Ah, you know, we could add that. It'd probably take about 20 minutes, but it's not there. So um, that hack wouldn't uh, work unless you knew some of the Python tools to copy an ROI from one time step to another or to copy an ROI uh, from one ROI into the time step of a multi-time ROI. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to unpack there for some of those advanced applications. Uh, next question, can you go over, okay, we answered that already. Can you mention some applications where 4D images are used? Well, there's a comment here, and it's a, a very uh, appropriate comment. When you have in situ loading, you can scan at different loads. You could also do the acid leaching experiment. Basically, anytime you have an experimental parameter and you want to capture the same 3D data set with that parameter uh, altered. So if you want to heat treat your sample, then your fourth dimension is temperature. If you want to in, uh, acid treat, your temperature would be exposure time to acid. If you want to uh, pump fluid through your sample, that's the synchrotron experiment we looked at from workers at Shell and Imperial College, etc. Uh, if you want to do the load. So there's all sorts of things where you may have a separate experimental parameter. Or of course the experimental parameter could be time as you're watching cells divide with light microscopes. So uh, yeah, so you've got X, Y, Z, and then some fourth dimension, which could be time. What would be the total 40 image size you can deal with without having too much trouble on a workstation with 128 gigabytes of RAM? Well, uh, the, so you are limited to what can fit in system memory. So if you're trying to do, you know, 60 gigabyte super high res micro CT scans and you're trying to collect 10 of them, well, you know, that's 600 gigabytes of data. So that's not going to fit in your workstation. So you just have to manage memory just like you would with 3D data. You only can work with what can fit in your workstation. However, you can, um, you can find workstations. These are unusual experiments, right? If you have the resources to conduct these really exotic 4D experiments, then you can probably find someone's machine you can lease or use that has a lot of memory. Or for that matter, you could use an Amazon computer. So when we need lots of memory, we work on a 480 gigabyte Amazon instance. It costs us about $5 an hour. So you can find the, the resources to uh, run Dragonfly that way. Uh, next question, it seems the current 4D is just simply provide a framework to put series 3D data sets in a box, but the processing is still done with conventional 3D pr uh, procedure. In principle, a user could do the same things manually with individual 3D data sets. Well, you could, but then you couldn't uh, inspect and visualize across data. You couldn't, if we didn't have the 4D framework, you wouldn't be able to make those animations. Um, the other thing that we look to do is to take, for example, profile, line profile and probe and ROI and mesh and graph and make those four dimensional so that if you had 4D structures, you could see how do these things change with respect to time. So they would, having that framework would be very valuable for being able to ask those sorts of questions. So uh, that's it for questions. I don't see any more questions. So thank you all for your attention. We will be back next week. We'll talk about macros on Monday, and we'll talk about how to simply record macros and play the Mac to automate your workflows and streamline your processing. Then on Tuesday, we'll talk about macros again, but we'll talk about the macro builder, how you can piece together macros with a very visual interface, no programming required for Monday or Tuesday. Then Wednesday through Friday, we'll dig into a little bit of Python with Dragonfly, how do you customize Dragonfly, how you can set up a development environment and add all sorts of customized extensions, and then if you want, share them with other users. So thank you all for your attention. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Stay healthy, be good to each other, and have a great weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.